Hello and welcome again to Capital Report here on WCMU Public Television. I'm David Nicholas and uh, we are continuing our season opening discussion with the former Michigan lawmaker and longtime political analyst Bill Ballinger, the editor and host of The Ballinger Report. You can uh, follow his writing and his podcasts at theballingerreport.com. He joins us via Zoom. Bill, thanks for being with us again this week. Glad to be with you, Dave. 2020 election. Uh, if we were to sum it up in one word, we couldn't. So uh, I'll give you as many words as you would like to uh, to try. Um, and, and the focus, obviously, here in Michigan, um, the integrity of the process as, as you look at it now, even at this juncture, just into the new administration, uh, our state, along with Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, supporters of the Trump campaign labeled the results as fraudulent, Claims of specific evidence were put forth by certain media outlets, but nothing conclusive was ever presented that led to any overturn of the results. You've watched politics for a long time, including what we saw in 2000. Anything that you've ever seen like this? No, uh, and I'll point out that of all the states you mentioned, I think Michigan clearly had the weakest claim to have been fraudulent because the margin that Joe Biden defeated Donald Trump by in Michigan was upwards of 150,000 votes, way bigger margin than in all those other states that you just mentioned. Very hard to find any evidence of fraud that would have made a difference in the result. Yeah, maybe there were a few minor instances, but 150,000 votes. Remember, Donald Trump only beat Hillary Clinton by 10,000 votes approximately four years ago. Now that was a real cliffhanger, but this one was not. So I think really what accounted for the margin that Joe Biden got and the fact that he won in Michigan was simply the huge turnout. This was the biggest turnout we've had in 60 years in Michigan uh, in percentage terms and quantitatively the biggest ever. And when you get a bigger turnout, you get proportionately more Democrats voting than Republicans. And I think that made the difference between Donald Trump winning Michigan narrowly four years ago and losing it in 2020. Is the process itself sound and intact? Because a lot of this seemed to look at the extraordinary circumstances of COVID and then the push for so much more uh, voting absentee, the mail-in ballots, and, and all of this activity that took place in the run-up before Election Day itself. Uh, we can hope that by 2022, in the midterms and in the next presidential election, we won't be facing circumstances like this. Would there be a pull back from the emphasis on early voting or mail-in voting? Uh, or do we have to tighten up some of the rules and regulations so that there maybe are not as many questions about the integrity of the process? That's a good question, David. I think it's very hard to put the genie back in the bottle. Once you get mail-in voting started, no reason absentee voting, such as we had in 2020, to a far greater extent than any time before in history, and that was due to two factors. The passage of Proposal 3 on the ballot statewide in 2018 and the coronavirus, as you pointed out. And when you get that big uh, a surge in mail-in voting, absentee, no reason voting, same day registration, uh, the Secretary of State taking it upon herself to mail out applications for absentee ballots to all voters, whether they'd asked for them or not, uh, that latter is something that could be tightened up or changed in 2022 or 24. But even if it is, I don't think it's going to make that much difference. As we're sitting down today, we're a couple of days in front of the second impeachment trial in the Senate. It is uh, scheduled actually to be getting underway um, earlier in the day that our audience will be uh, joining us for this conversation. So we don't want to try to even remotely speculate on how the process will go. But as a whole, if we look at the process, if the president is... Uh, found guilty or acquitted, the impact that that would have 
looking to 2022 or certainly ahead to the next presidential election? Should the president be barred from running for office again or his status as a public figure in terms of how the Republican Party as a whole would move forward um, as a Trump party, a different type of Republican party, a return to a different form of Republican party? What are your thoughts? Only if he is convicted, David, do I think it would really make any difference. Because at that point, the Senate could be in a position, and they've got a Democratic majority, to bar him from ever running again. But if he's not convicted, uh, which is, I think, going to be the case, uh, I think this is really pretty much a futile exercise. And I really question whether the Democrats are doing themselves any good by pursuing this. Uh, I think it looks to the American people uh, at this point like extraneous, irrelevant undertaking and perhaps a bit of a vendetta by the Democrats and vengeance, which is not an attractive characteristic to have as a political party. So I'm not sure where we're going with this. It's, bo you know, it's bogging up all the progress uh, in Washington on things that are much more important, like the budget, uh, like the COVID-19 stimulus package, like uh, Joe Biden's confirmation appointments uh, process. Uh, I just think it's, it's really an unfortunate situation that this is going on. You mentioned that budget process and, and COVID relief. Uh, as we sit down today, it was earlier this morning, actually, that uh, the Senate came to a 50-50 tie, the deciding vote coming from uh, Vice President Harris to move ahead towards uh, likely that uh, $1.3 trillion uh, relief package for COVID-19. We There was a lot of speculation heading into those uh, runoffs in Georgia as to how the nature of, of power would go in the Senate. Do you think we're now seeing what could be a regular trend? Do you think we'll stay as much on party line votes for a lot of the legislative agenda moving forward where it will continue to come down to that deciding vote from the vice president? As you know, David, uh, President Biden has issued a ringing call of unity, right? But I noticed that earlier in the week, uh, he said something to the effect of, Unity doesn't necessarily mean bipartisanship. <laughs> and, and it looks to me like that's what's going on right now. There's not any bipartisanship. Obviously, if Kamala Harris had to break the tie 51-50, uh, uh, the Democrats are basically going it alone. They didn't get any Republican support at all. Uh, the Democrats... <laughs> In my view, I've got to be careful that they're not going to make the same mistake they did back in 2010 uh, when, with Obamacare and several other things, a stimulus package is another back then, uh, they went it alone. They didn't get any Republican support. And the voters paid them back in spades. And the election of 2010 was a national disaster for the Democrats. Barack Obama himself said, we took a shellacking. Well, uh, you know what? Uh, the same thing could happen again in 2022 if the Democrats do not, in fact, try to achieve the, quote, unity, unquote, through bipartisanship that that would seem to be token. It doesn't seem um, that it is much of a, a bipartisan atmosphere or, or attitude either when we look at um, the run of executive orders early on in the new administration. It's certainly not uncommon that an incoming president will issue a series of orders to overturn or, or uh, revise the work of uh, a predecessor. We certainly saw it with uh, the incoming Obama administration, looking back at Bush policy, certainly in the early days of the Trump administration to reverse Obama. But Anything on this scale, it, it, I'm hearing that it's the most executive orders since FDR. Um, and it, it just gives you the feeling that, that it's going to continue to be a very toxic atmosphere in Washington, D.C. I think that's true. I think you've got it absolutely right. I mean, Joe Biden, even though he's a very low-key, moderate-sounding guy, 
is actually taking some pretty aggressive, progressive steps through his executive orders and now through this uh, reconciliation budget being passed by the Senate. So let's see what happens going forward. At, at some point, it seems to me there's going to be some need by the Biden administration for bipartisan cooperation. But so far, uh, I do not see Joe Biden and or the Senate and House Democrats reaching out for that kind of cooperation. You say moderate sounding guy, and that has been the reputation. Is it an influence then coming from the far left corners of the party, from a, a Senator Bernie Sanders or a Representative uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez or even the president's vice president, Kamala Harris? And, and I say that in, in contrast to what was claimed to be this ascent uh, and resurgence of the far right under Donald Trump, he's gone. Who are perhaps those in lockstep with him or those that would be thought of as further right than now the former president? Um, where are these extremes likely to collide? Yeah, we haven't even talked about the uh, roiling controversy within the Republican Party in the two caucuses in the House and Senate in Washington. When it comes to Biden, I don't think he's necessarily being pushed by the left wing of his party. I think Joe Biden, you got to remember, no matter what, no matter how moderate he sounds, no matter how benign, no matter how mild mannered, he's a Democrat and he's got a different agenda than Donald Trump. And there's a lot of pent up anger in the Democratic Party about things that Donald Trump did. And to a great extent, what Joe Biden is doing is simply undoing what Donald Trump did. And he's saying, let's go back to the status quo ante before Trump uh, under Obama or under Bill Clinton even. Uh, so I think you're going to see Joe Biden continue along that track. But whether uh, the American electorate thinks that he is being too partisan and not being uh, seeking cooperation from the Republicans as much as he should, uh, that could spell trouble. Now, on the Republican side, the two big things that happened last week were uh, Liz Cheney saving her job uh, as the number three leader in the House Republican caucus. She was under fire because she voted to impeach Donald Trump. So there was a big push from the right within the Republican caucus to purge her from her leadership post. She withstood it. Uh, she won pretty handily, about three to one uh, in the vote. Then there was Marjorie Taylor Greene, the freshman congresswoman from Georgia, who in an unprecedented way has had her committee assignments stripped from her by the Democratic majority. And it was interesting to me, Dave, to see that there were only Repu 11 Republicans uh, in the House Republican caucus who voted to strip her of her committee assignments. One of them was from Michigan, good old Fred Upton from the 6th uh, Congressional District, Southwest Michigan. Uh, he had voted earlier uh, to impeach Donald Trump, uh, but he uh, also backed that up by saying, I think uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, did and said things that are totally unacceptable and she's got to be punished. But he was the only Republican in the Michigan delegation who voted that way. All the Democrats voted that way to strip her of her committee assignments. And David, this is perhaps the first time in the history of this country that you've ever seen that happen. And it could come back to haunt the Democrats again, because if the Republicans get a uh, majority status at some point again, what's to stop them from saying, we don't like a particular Democrat, we think he or she is too far to the left and we're going to take their committee assignments away from them. Not a good thing. Social media in that same argument, obviously uh, the, the big stir that was created when uh, even prior to um, or once the, the election was concluded, but the, the president being uh, taken off of social media. And, and I just wonder if then if you if you see it as a real possibility where 
platforms like that or the action within the halls of Congress where there will be more and more moves to repress or even silence the votes that are, are the strongest to one side, uh, the far left of uh, the Democratic Party and the far right of the Republican Party? Well, the real question is, will Congress take any action against these social media giants like Google and Facebook uh, and try and take their unilateral power away from them to shut down speech, to take away platforms, to silence Donald Trump or anybody they don't like. Uh, there is a push in Congress, and it actually comes as much from Democrats as Republicans saying this is not right. These uh, media giants have too much power. On the other hand, if uh, one party or the other, uh, and the Democrats are the ones in the majority right now in Washington, think, you know what? Uh, we actually like what these me social media giants are doing. They're silencing certain people that we don't want to hear from, like Donald Trump. So go to it uh, and keep doing it. But what they've got to worry about, these people in Congress, is what happens if the worm turns at some point and the social media giant begins to silence one of them? Then what? That's why I say there is a big controversy right now in the Congress and among, you know, the intelligentsia in this country who debate this sort of thing about whether or not social media giants should be reined in, have their wings clipped, their power reduced. Uh, you know, they're the new version of print media in the 19th century. So this is the big issue going forward. You mentioned in that discussion, uh, Michigan Congressman Fred Upton, uh, we've got uh, the new face in Peter Meyer from West Michigan and all that controversy that came with uh, the departure of, of Justin Amash. Looking at the Michigan delegation as a whole, um, U.S. Senator Gary Peters won re-election. He has now been given uh, some fairly strong positions of um, of influence and, and impact in the party moving forward in this session. In fact, it's something you recently wrote about in the Ballinger Report. Um, he brags, uh, boasts, I suppose is a, is a, is a better term, to, of the number of bills that he was a part of that got through and got uh, the signature of former President Trump. And yet at the same time, you point out that he's one of, if not the least known senator among the hundred in Washington. So. Does he now have political sway or not so much moving forward? Well, I think he obviously is going to have some sway. If he's chairman of the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, that's the key thing. That's the committee in charge of delivering the majority to the Democrats in 2022. That's a very important position. Now, also, for the first time ever, in the Senate. Gary Peters is now in the majority. It's very narrow, but he can now chair committees and subcommittees. He never was able to do that before. I think the interesting thing about Gary Peters is, will he continue to tout his bipartisan cooperation with Republicans, which he's done for six years, but that's when he was in the minority. So that was a great thing to talk about. Now that he's in the majority and he doesn't really need the Republicans anymore, will he continue to do that? Particularly when he's chairman of the Senatorial Campaign Committee, which is trying to beat the tar out of the Republicans. So I think this is a really fascinating story going forward. Congresswoman Tlaib from Southeast Michigan uh, has been um, kind of grouped together in that, that group that includes uh, AOC, the squad, and, and they are seen as a far left flank. Is there anybody that even in a minority status you see as a very strong rice, uh, voice rather from the further right uh, among Michigan's congressional delegation? I wouldn't say there's anybody who rises to that level on the conservative right side in the Michigan delegation. I mean, Tim Wahlberg is conservative but he's not the AOC of the right. I, I don't think he's not emblematic of a right-wing squad. 
Um, so I don't think Michigan has people like that. Now you look at somebody like this Marjorie Taylor Green from Georgia, whom I just talked about. She's kind of an example of a right wing squad. And guess what? Uh, the Democrats don't like her very much, Dave, and they just stripped her of her committees. So, you know, there's a little bit of a double standard going on here, I think. Uh, but we'll find out what happens next. One of the things that we had talked about last week was um, potentially impacting Michigan's economy um, in alternative energy with former Michigan Governor Jennifer Granholm. Uh, now the pick for uh, the Department of Energy uh, secretary position. And, and I wonder if you see that along with Governor Whitmer's uh, presence in, in the Democratic uh, National Committee. Um, does this elevate Michigan's uh, position overall as, as an individual state in terms of, of influence? How much are we collectively uh, likely to have Joe Biden's ear? I think the fact that uh, Gretchen Whitmer has this relationship with Joe Biden that she does very close. The fact that Jennifer Granholm is in the cabinet, she's a former governor of Michigan, and she was an apostle of green energy when she was governor, and she is now. And I think all of that is good for Michigan. I think it helps to have Jennifer Granholm and Gretchen Whitmer and the positions they're in and their relationship to a Democratic president like Joe Biden. That can't but help compared to the situation over the last four years where there was open antagonism between Donald Trump and the top officials in Michigan. What do you think, and, and we, we mentioned this in uh, regards to the, the level of partisanship and, and the 50-50 tie that was just broken on the vote by the vice president, uh, but there have been talks about, uh, and certainly this was the cry post-election, as to the potential threats of packing the Supreme Court, abolishing the filibuster, granting statehood to D.C. and Puerto Rico to bolster Democratic representation. Do... Is there that much of a mandate um, that we could see this much of a swing even in these first four years or perhaps even within the first two of this new Biden administration? I don't think there was that much of a mandate in the general election in November. I mean, that was clear. The Republicans gained seats in the U.S. House, almost unprecedented. Uh, if they had won just one of the two Georgia special election seats, they'd still have the Senate. You know what, David? They could still get control of the Senate. Uh, if Joe Manchin should decide in West Virginia, you know what? I'm just going to walk across the aisle here. Uh, I'll be an independent. I'll caucus with the Republicans. That happened 20 years ago. Uh, the other way around, when Jim Jeffords, who was a Republican from Vermont, and it was a 50-50 Senate, he took a walk away from the Republican Party and caucus with the Democrats, and suddenly the Democrats were in the majority. That can happen again. Uh, when it comes to these specific bills you're talking about, they can't really be accomplished by reconciliation, which we went through in the first part of our little interview session here. They have to get, you know, a supermajority 60 votes, and the Democrats are a long way from that. So the idea that a lot of this stuff that Democrats would love to have happen and Republicans are scared to death will happen, I just think it's very unlikely. We have a little under a minute left, and, and there's not really time to, to and, I, and I don't want to, again, return to any sort of a speculation over impeachment or even try to get too much of a, of a crystal ball, but in, in the wake of a State of the Union address, which a newly elected president typically, you know, by tradition does not give, have we seen essentially, based on the amount of executive order action um, and actions taken by the new president, have we seen a lot of that agenda rolled out already, or do you think there is more to come? Both. I think we've seen a lot of it already. I think there's going to be a lot more. And I tend to agree. I don't think Joe Biden getting up and giving a State of the Union would make much difference at this point. A month from now, probably nobody would remember what he said. I think the bottom line is, what has he been doing? 
And he's been doing a lot to undo what Donald Trump did. And that's what the Democrats were pledged to do when they won election last November. So as we leave it there, there is much to watch, not only in uh, Lansing, but uh, certainly in Washington and perhaps uh, intersecting along the way uh, as we move forward. Um, Bill Ballinger, thanks as always for being our guest and and, uh, lending the perspective as uh, you always do. We appreciate the time and thanks for being with us. Thank you very much, David. We appreciate your time and attention here again on Capitol Report. We've been speaking with Bill Ballinger of The Ballinger Report. Again, you can follow his writing and his podcast at theballingerreport.com. I'm David Nicholas says now that we've set the stage uh, in the the post-2020 election time, uh, we'll be moving forward with many of our guests from uh, Michigan's uh, lawmakers, and we hope that you'll join us as soon. We'll talk again.